extensions. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Eric, for recording. Okay, the, job, the adoption of the agenda is passed. Uh, do we have an adoption of the December 15th Borough Board meeting minutes? So move to, move to adopt. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Great, thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great, any opposed or abstentions? Okay, the, uh, the meeting minutes are passed. Uh, next, uh, we have, I see we have our borough president on. We also have our council member, Eric Botcher on. Um, so, uh, uh, borough president, up to you if you'd like to speak first, or we're happy to have uh, the council member uh, give a brief report. Please go Great. first, borough president. All Thank right. You. Well, you're, you're, you're very kind, Eric. Great to see you. Great to see everyone this morning. Happy New Year. Also, happy Lunar New Year. I'll probably be seeing many of you in the days ahead as we celebrate. Lunar New Year in Chinatown and beyond. Very excited about that. Also very excited we have two brand new board chairs with us. So welcome, welcome, Marquis Harrison from CB10. Uh, welcome, Catherine. Is Catherine still on uh, yes. from CB12? Okay. Welcome, Catherine Diaz as well. Hey, great to see you. Just so excited about uh, your leadership, both of you. Um, uh, we have heard complaints from almost every one of your boards about the new 5G towers. And um, we've had concerns ourselves. And we have written a letter to the Office of Technology and Innovation um, um, calling for them to slow down installation in residential areas. We have a number of concerns about that. Um, first, we want to ensure there's accountability on um, their citing decisions being consistent with the need to prioritize underserved areas. Uh, this is something that's been a bit of a battleground issue in the rollout of the kiosks. Um, we we want to make sure that they're um, achieving equity in the way that they um, choose sightings. Uh, we, we also uh, I think more time is needed to explore use of existing infrastructure um, as opposed to creating uh, entirely new units. Um, these could be potentially installed on top of uh, bus shelters. Et cetera, um, lamppost. Uh, these strategies would be less obtrusive, um, and um, uh, we're, we're not convinced they've been uh, fully explored. And we also have some concerns about the aesthetics and the design. So um, we'll let you know as soon as we hear back from OTI on that. But um, many of you have discussed this topic in your board meetings, and we wanted you to know um, that it's something that we're taking. Uh, extremely seriously. Um, of course, board applications are open and uh, we, we achieved a near record turnout last year with over 900. Um, we're gonna try and beat that this year. Uh, and, and we want your help to make sure, of course, that your members reapply if they're up, but that also we get a broader pool of applicants from uh, communities at large. We're, we're always looking for dynamic new leaders. You've got until, um, uh, March 17th, I believe, is the deadline at this point. Um, another pending deadline is our application for capital, which um, is, I believe, February 23rd. So if, if you and members of your board have ideas on um, everything from schools to libraries to parks to uh, affordable housing, that uh, cultural institutions that could use capital investment from our office, uh, deadline's coming up. So um, reach out to our team, reach out to our budget team. Um, we'd, we'd really love to, to work with you on that. Um, I'm, uh, I'm attending a, a, a couple of, of really important events this morning I wanna let you know about. One at 10, there's a, a convening under the auspices of the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce with um, about 20 bids and a few other local entities to talk about public safety. Um, and we're expecting presentations from um, the, the DA, uh, the mayor, uh, reps for the PD. And this is an important conversation. I'm excited about the way this one is structured this morning because it really is trying to focus on the facts, on the data, uh, and to make it constructive um, and, and get beyond some of the, some of the noise uh, and, and the more unproductive rhetoric. So uh, I'll be speaking uh, there at, at, at about 10. We'll update you on, on that conversation. And then at 11.30, we have a convening um, uh, at which uh, the new uh, awards for the Downtown Reinvestment Initiative will be announced. 
Um, this is a, a state program that offers money to invest in, in upgrades in public space and, and communities that need it. Um, we've been working over the past year uh, in Chinatown where we were able to implement uh, a $20 million uh, DRI investment. Uh, um, shout out to uh, my wonderful predecessor, Gail Brewer, who uh, secured that money a little over a year ago. We announced the projects uh, a few weeks ago. It's gonna be really impactful in Chinatown. We have applied for a DRI for East Harlem. Uh, we've applied for $10 million to upgrade infrastructure there. Uh, we're expecting an announcement on the awards later today. So I uh, don't want to jinx anything, but uh, we'll, we'll let you know about that. Um, I think it's uh, uh, going to be great if we can pull it off for East Harlem. Um, and uh, finally, just want to mention that we, ha we have a number of labor leaders coming on this morning. Is, is that, am I correct about that, Tricia? And my goodness, I was looking at this, but Manhattan specifically, not just New York City, Manhattan specifically has been the scene of uh, some of the most important labor victories really in the country over the past, um, uh, I don't know, nine months or so, and, and, a, and a few more that are still pending. But uh, in, in April, the Starbucks roastery in Chelsea became the first roastery in America to vote to unionize, uh, which was a major victory in December. Um, we had a major victory after a strike at the new school of adjunct faculty um, where they won uh, important uh, contract concessions, particularly on healthcare. Um, they're under United Auto Workers. Uh, of course, just a couple of weeks ago, well, really last week, we had uh, a major victory for nurses um, at Mount Sinai on the east side that were striking, um, uh, not, not for salaries, a uh, little bit of a misconception there. They were striking primarily uh, to achieve better ratios, uh, better patient staffing ratios. It's been um, a huge problem. That's, that's not good for patients. It's not good for staff. And they won uh, really significant concessions. Um, but there's, a, there's a, an ongoing strike still at HarperCollins uh, for really low paid uh, editorial staff and other roles there. They're still out on strike. In fact, it's been, they just passed the 50 day mark. So. Um, we got more work to do, but really great that we're being joined by labor allies this morning and that, and that they're focusing, I believe, on uh, environmental upgrades, green upgrades in our schools. Uh, just a, a great indication of the way that labor matters uh, uh, in almost every field that, that we care about. Um, finally, we're coming up on our first ever State of the Borough Address, January 31st, Tuesday, January 31st, 6 p.m. at City College. Um, we're so excited about this. Uh, we'd love to see you there and board members there and love for your help to spread the word. It's going to be, um, uh, I think, a really uh, significant uh, evening of policy discussions and more and celebration. So hope to see all of you there. That's it from me. Um, I see a hand up from Tammy, uh, excuse me, from Janine. Um, uh, Trisha, I don't know if there's time, but uh, happy to take Janine's question. Hi. Hi. Um Thank you for your letter on 5G. I really appreciate it. The quick question is, you know, in Community Board 2, we have a lot of mixed use districts. So they might look like they're commercial or manufacturing, but they're they're residential as well. So I just want to, um, that's sort of the biggest issue is so the, the way the rules are written, it, it, they can basically put up these 5G towers in many, many neighborhoods that are not exclusively residential. And I just wanted to know if you would be able to also address that if possible. Thank you. Well, first, um, let me say, Janine, that we are 1000% with you on this. And um, we're, we're ready to push really hard. And I, I understand what you're talking about where you have um, locations where it might not be clear if it's commercial and residential, um, but we know that that's impacting, impacting a lot of residents uh, and so we, we will push to clarify that. But again, we're, we're, we're with you on this. Um, and as soon as we get word from OTI, we'll update you. Thank you, Janine. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Borough President. And apologies for anybody for my cameras acting strange. But next, we'll go to uh, Council Member Eric Botcher. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone's having a great week. It's really great to be here with you. And thank you, Borough President Levine, for 
including me today. Um, I want to mention a couple of things that I think may be of interest to community boards. One is our effort to combat noise pollution in our district. And I am going to go out on a limb and, and guess that all over Manhattan, people are bothered by the cars that modify their mufflers and tailpipes to violate to the point where they violate state and local noise ordinances. The Department of Environmental Protection has a pilot for roadside sound uh, sensors and cameras that will automatically ticket vehicles that violate the ordinances. And they, they conducted that pilot last year. I wrote to the commissioner of DEP in the fall requesting one of those cameras in our district. And that camera has been installed in Council District 3. They don't say exactly where these are because they have been vandalized in the past. People have climbed up the poles to disable these. That's how much they don't like them if they you know, really care about having these vehicles with the missing mufflers. Um, I'd like to see them all over Manhattan because I think that people should know if they drive in with these um, you know, ear splitting uh, vehicles, they'll get a ticket in the mail. Another uh, initiative we've taken on is um, another quality of life issues to address uh, graffiti in our district and not, not street art, but vandalism of small businesses, of public spaces. Um, and we have funded um, ACE, which does a lot of supplemental cleaning in a lot of your community boards to do this cleanup. And so we're soliciting from residents, asking residents to send in addresses of where um, there's been uh, graffiti vandalism, but they're also, they're gonna remove all the graffiti on all the mailboxes, the, the utility poles on the, on the corners. And that to me is just a very important piece of lifting the city up during this tough time when people are really looking at New York closely and wanna make sure that we are um, getting our act together and putting our best foot forward for residents, for visitors, et cetera. So that's, um, an initiative of ours. We have um, in our district been, uh, you know, LGBTQ issues have been a big, uh, have really come to the fore in our district. I think you might all have seen the drag story hour uh, protesters who really crossed the line in a lot of ways. Um, vandalized my district office, came to my apartment building. Two of them were arrested for entering the building. A third one was arrested for assaulting one of my neighbors. Um, we've been really pushing back against this environment of LGBTQ hate that's happening right now. But another thing that's been happening is um, in, in at nightlife venues, there is um, an a, massive investigation by the NYPD and the Manhattan District Attorney into um, people who've been victimizing um, nightlife patrons and, and robbing them, drugging them and robbing them. There were, there were two deaths last year at nightclub venues, um, people who had left nightclub um, venues in Hell's Kitchen and the NYPD and were later found dead and robbed, um, drugged. And the NYPD and the DA, I've met with them repeatedly and they assure me that they have a full complement of investigators assigned to solving these cases. But in the meantime, we've been in our office focusing a lot on education of patrons about, about nightlife safety with tips like um, make sure that you tell your friends where you're going at all times. If you, if you meet someone that you don't know, make sure you tell your friends who they are. Um, turn off the facial recognition on your banking app because people have been holding the banking apps up to people's faces to unlock them and transferring the money out. 
Um, we are having on, on February 2nd um, at the LGBT Center, we're doing a fentanyl strip giveaway. And a fentanyl strip is how people can, um, for you or someone else, you can test controlled substances and, and, and recreational drugs to make sure that they don't contain fentanyl. It's, it's something that is, they're too hard to get, but they sure should really be ubiquitous in this day and age when fentanyl is a huge, huge problem. Um, today, the council's passing a bill that I'm sponsoring with council member Marjorie Velez uh, Velasquez to um, address single use plastics in New York. I think single use plastics are a huge problem that haven't been uh, really addressed and our oceans and our streams and our, our, our environment is getting choked by plastic. And in New York, um, when you order takeout to your house, they'll send you a ton of like plastic cutlery and a ton of condiments. I have a whole drawer full of plastic cutlery in my house. So the, the bill we're passing today will uh, require folks to opt in to getting the cutlery. It sounds like a small step. Um, and the condiments and the, and the napkins, it sounds like a small step, but we've got to change the narrative on single use plastics, including all the pallets of bottled water that we go through every day unnecessarily when we have some of the best drinking water. I think that as New Yorkers, we really have to step up in our effort to reduce the use of single use plastic because a huge percentage of the ocean surface is floating islands of plastic. And, and that's something that it sounds like a, a, a small issue in the scheme of things, but it's a really big issue. So we're gonna be taking that on, on the city council. Um, lastly, I want to um, really commend the, Manhattan Borough President Levine and, and all of you who have been speaking out about the need to create housing in New York City. We are facing in the next 10 years a potential catastrophe and a humanitarian crisis potentially that dwarfs what we're going through now with rising rents and rising homelessness if we don't create enough housing for the population increase that we are predicted to face. Between 2010 and 2020, New York City saw a net population gain of 430,000 people. That's the population of Detroit. We only created 2010 units of housing. That is primarily responsible for what we're seeing with the rise in rents of market rate units. And if we don't up production of housing over the next 10 years, that trend is gonna continue. And the trend of homelessness, it has really troubling, um, it's troubling to think of what could happen. So um, Community Board 4 put out a plan last month to create um, thousands of units of housing, they identified where it should go, many thousands of units of affordable housing. Um, it's something that I think uh, it's a hard thing to do um, when you ever you talk about new construction, but I really want to commend Community Board 4. It's, it's, you know, Community Board 4 has a lot of some vacant and underdeveloped lots, so it's a little more of a challenge in other community boards, no doubt. But I think it's something that collectively we should all join hands together and, and work on together for the future of the city. Um, thank you for having me today. Really appreciate it. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Council Member. Um, unless there's any other questions, then we're going to move on. Oh, I see one from Xavier. Real quick, thank you, Council Member. Apologies for the background noise. Just finished drop off, walking back to the home office. Um, when it comes to the noise pollution cameras, um, we have less of an issue with 
modified exhaust systems um, for those that aren't engaging with an OEM stock exhaust. We have more of an issue with quality of life and noise complaints with the dirt bikes, uh, quads that are all legal in the community that not only cause a high volume of noise pollution, but also safety issues within CB11. I'm wondering if the council or if you're even open to entertaining some type of legislation that will help us curtail that or at least an enforcement mechanism because people, if they've gone up on sidewalks, uh, run into our elderly, et cetera, and so on as well. Yeah, those are awful. I grew up in the Adirondacks where dirt, bike, or <laughs> dirt bikes and four wheelers were a big thing. I never would have imagined seeing them in Manhattan, but I have. Problem there is that they don't have license plates. They're not, you can't ticket them with a camera. Um, and they are, they are already against the law. So on, on the enforcement end, it's, it's a big challenge and the city and the PD need to step up whatever they're doing to enforce it. I remember de Blasio like driving a tractor over some of the seized bikes, but it, it really is a big problem. And I'd like to be as helpful. If there is something the council can do legislatively that we haven't, that, that hasn't been done, I, I'm all ears on that. Beverly? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, I'd like to pile on on the no noise pollution issue um, where uh, we are on the Upper West Side. One very uh, uh, noticeable concern is um, the noise caused by sirens, uh, many of which are very extended in the length of time that they're on and extremely loud uh, and wondered whether the council is perhaps also focused on that source of noise pollution. Thank you. So one of the bills that I wanted to carry is the bill that would change the emergency sirens to the uh, European style tones, which are far less um, uh, grating and they do the trick in most of the world. Um, that bill is being carried by Councilmember Rivera, I believe, and it has faced opposition from emergency services. I think we need to push forward with that because the sirens, um, they can't, they're not gonna, we met with EMS and asked them, do you have to have them running? at night when there's no cars on the road and the answer is oh, many instances yes because they don't want people to like dart out if they're exceeding the speed limit at all they don't want to drive without that siren on so they do they run them all night and the other one of the other big problems is that the cars now are being built to really have pin drop quiet cockpits, so to speak, right? So you see these car commercials where they brag about not being able to hear anything outside. That makes it so hard for the sirens to get through. So they they are experimenting and, and rolling out these um, rumble devices that will shake the ground around the cars. But I think we... Um, we, we can do better. And that's why I support that bill to change the sirens to the more of a European tone. Uh, I'm gonna check in with council member Rivera about that again. It's one I really wanted to have that, but I think we, um, we, we can and should push it forward. Great, thank you again, council member. Thanks everyone. Um we're gonna uh, move right along here and uh, go to our featured speaker. So um, with that, I wanna uh, thank uh, Tori, Tori, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly, Caso, Queso? Queso, <laughs> got it right the second time. <laughs> and, and I apologize, Tori, I was just about to pass it over to you. I also just wanna say hello to our council member, Gail Brewer, who's joined us. Uh, apologies, council member, I didn't see you earlier. Um, if you don't mind, we'll go to the council member just in case she's got um, any sort of pressing uh, additional events that she needs to go to. 
for a brief update, and then we'll go straight over to Tori Queso and, and the rest of our uh, featured speakers today. I'll be very quick. I do have a 10 o'clock meeting. So thank you so much to the council. So I think you can see that we've been spending a lot of time on the issue of smoke shops. I don't know where it's going to end. I have to think, thank the sheriff. Obviously, we did a survey on the Upper West Side and found that there were 28 out of 63 who were selling illegally, maybe more. And there are 1,400 citywide in terms of illegal smoke shops. And obviously, just one legal smoke shop and 11 illegal ones around the legal one. Um, yesterday, um, Health Department, Consumer Affairs, Police Department, and the Sheriff testified for, we were there for about five hours. And I think what came out of it was, there is a task force that the mayor is focused on. They are going to the smoke shops, but uh, clearly one you close, and it takes a, quite a few hours to get all of that product into different bags that are labeled. Um, and then it opens the next day. I don't know where all this money is coming from. Um, and it takes a while for the oath to schedule a meeting so that the parties can come together and you either get fined or you don't. Nobody's going to jail. Um, the fines in one shop can be up to 90000 because you have a fine for this and a fine for that. But you can delay it at oath. So that's the reality of what's going on. At the same time, I was at a high school last night, and you know the vaping for the young people is pandemic levels. They are, it's really hard, particularly in schools where there's high schools near. I don't know how these shops can be near schools. I'm supposed to be 500 feet away. One woman testified at the hearing yesterday, it's 100 feet from her middle school. So you can see the problems. Nobody wants to get arrested. We all want the legitimate shops to do well. So I'm just giving you the short version, and perhaps there's some new laws we can use to stop the owners of the buildings from renting. Um, the state office should have legislation sometime this year that gives them more authority. Right now, they have none to deal with the illegal shop. It's just the sheriff. Um, and maybe there are other administrative ways that we can deal with this issue. So I just want to let you know we are working on it as much as we can. Second, of course, as you heard from all this, is the budget. I'm on the budget negotiation um, and also on finance. And I think that, um, you know, you should let us know, obviously, social services, libraries, um, pre-K, probably other education issues, and the list is endless about what we will uh, want to have restored. And then, of course, what, how do you deal with the budget when there's a shortfall? So all of that is on the table. I must admit one thing. I'm pleased and thank the mayor and thank the Parks Department after much lobbying by me and others is the Soldiers and Sailors Monument, which is a big deal on the Upper West Side, 100 years old, Civil War, et cetera. It's in really bad shape, has a fence around it, but we got $62 million in the budget um, to complete its renovation or restoration. So that's a really um, big deal. Um, I think um, also to thank, I want to thank Congressman Nadler because he um, has gotten uh, security cameras from many of the NYCHAs in my district. And I wasn't able to do it in last year's budget, so I do want to thank him. Uh, you may have heard in terms of the biggest issue for the city, which is city council, is the uh, 250,000 retirees do not want to have their senior care changed in any way. And so this has been an issue in the city council. Um, so I don't need to get into all the specifics, but there's a budget shortfall of 600 million if their senior care is not changed. The unions are concerned, some of them, so is the mayor. So it's a back and forth. Right now, there are not enough votes to sign anything to make changes. So I don't know where it's going to end up, but that's where it is uh, right now. Um, we're all doing up to sort of budgeting. So we'll uh, look at the uh, list of uh, projects that have been uh, submitted with a, some kind of a uh, task force, and we'll pick some and then we'll put it to a vote. The speaker kind of gave each council member $100,000 um, to spend on public safety. And I know some of my colleagues, to their credit, have used it for rat mitigation or cleanup. So what I decided to do, I'm gonna announce it next week, is um, hire people to work at NYCHA, young people go door to door, literally, working with some of the nonprofits in NYCHA, 
and see if we can not get every single person possible working, school, whatever it takes, so that, that those buildings, Amsterdam is huge, um, know that there is the possibility of um, that particular building. There's actually another uh, state grant that was involved. So it's pretty much the amount of money that we have. And we're going to see if we can get every single person working or in school or whatever they want. Seniors already have a lot of help, but whatever you need as a family, you're going to get. And that's what we're going to do with our hundred thousand um, dollars. And I think um, those are the ch challenges, and we're all very excited about the nurses, the ones that got the private hospitals, and now we're looking at the public hospitals. Nurses are beloved, and I do want to thank Ruth Messenger for something because on Christmas Day at her synagogue, SAJ, she had a Christmas lunch for 125 asylum seeking families. And it couldn't have been nice. It was a very, very special event and showed what the West Side is capable of. Thank you very much. Thank you so thank you so much, Councilmember. Um uh, I just I see uh just before Tori, I I am rudely take away the mic from you. Um one more time. Um I just see. Chris Marte here. Um, if the council member wants to say hello, I want to give it over to him. Hi. Hey, everyone. I hope everyone started off the year the right way. Um, since Kale mentioned a lot of things that are happening in the council, I just want to talk about a few things. Uh, so today we'll be passing an age, a package of aging bills, which will help seniors age in place and give them a lot of resources, especially financially as prices continue to increase. Um, I'm introducing a bill that's related to 9-11 illness and outreach to NYPD, FDNY, and civilian employees that are near the area. One of the things that my office has been experiencing throughout the year is uh, a lot of widows, sadly, has been coming to our office and looking for documentations to see if their loved ones were near or working around um, um, Ground Zero. And what we saw was that the police department and the fire department didn't have the adequate paperwork or records of who was there and when they were there. And so this is something we really want to make sure that we can do uh, so that people could get the, the package and the health care that's, that's owed to them. Um, this weekend is the start of Lunar New Year. Uh, we had a big hearing this past week about passing a resolution to make Lunar New Year an official holiday and a, a school recognized holiday uh, because it falls on Sunday. Um, kids don't have school, so we're, we're asking the DOE to t have Monday off. Um, so I'll let you know as that um, continues to progress. But here in Chinatown, um, we're having our big festival um, around noon on Sunday. Come down, enjoy, shop around, eat at our restaurants. It's a, it's a day of celebration. Um, and the Year of the Rabbit has a lot of good values. Um, and so, yeah, that's mostly it. I want to thank Gail for having that oversight hearing yesterday on the uh, illegal smoke shops that have been opening up all throughout Manhattan. The Manhattan delegation is working together to do a coordinated effort to make sure that the sheriff's office is responsive to us. And so it just doesn't happen only once where we only get one sweep and they continue to pop up and we need to figure out a way to systemically uh, shut down these locations because they are causing a lot of harm to quality of life and to people's health. Um, so we'll have more on that soon. But thank you all for being on. Uh, hopefully, I'll see you all this Saturday, uh, this Sunday in Chinatown. That sounds great. You're the rabbit. Let's go. Thanks, Council Member. Um, okay, moving on. And again, thank you, Tori, for your patience. Welcome, Tammy. Welcome, Kyle. Welcome, Paul. Um, happy to have you guys all join us. But with no further ado, I'll pass it over to Tori Casso and our other spe featured speakers today. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so I am going to, so I will get into a presentation, but um, since a couple of our uh, labor leaders need to hop off, I'm going to have them introduce themselves first, but uh, just to give some context, Climate Jobs New York um, is a coalition of unions representing 2.6 million workers with a mission to advocate for clean energy economy at the scale climate science demands, creating good union jobs and supporting more equitable communities and a more resilient New York. 
Um, and we have some, you know, one of our campaigns is the Carbon Free and Healthy Schools campaign, which we are here to present to you. Um, but before that, I will uh, pass it over to Santos um, to kick it off. And then uh, we'll go around the horn and um, our, our uh, partners in labor um, can introduce themselves. Thank you very much, Troy. Thank you, Trisha. Thank you, everyone, council members, borough president's office. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen some of you on or in person, so good seeing everyone here. Uh, my name is Santos Rodriguez. I'm the chief of staff of the New York City Building Trades, very involved here with the Carbon Free and Healthy School campaign. You know, we work with four pre-apprenticeship programs here in New York City, one of which I'm a graduate of, the Edgar J. Malloy Initiative for Construction Skills, almost 24 years in the business, 25 years in the business now. And it was all through the gateway of these pre-apprenticeship programs that allowed us to come in. And here today, I, I sit in front of you guys all representing and advocating for that same opportunity for many of our people that live and come from our underserved uh, communities, right? So this is, this is really uh, important to us. It's driven by us to make sure that we have the same opportunities given to our community members in, in New York City and in, in Manhattan specifically as well, right? The second, right? Uh, when we think about carbon-free and healthy school, I remember spending a, uh, a year in summer school at George Westinghouse with no AC, hot throughout the entire summer. That was probably the last time I ever spent uh, a year in summer school. But needless to say, when you think about our school systems, we think about air, we think about COVID, right? We, we need to make sure that we revamp our schools to really make and save for our students to just give them a place to have a better learning environment, right? So uh, thank you, I'll pass it on. Tori, thank you, thank you everyone. I, I have to jump, but thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Santos. Um, Beth, since you're off mute, if you wanna go next. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Beth Chevry, and I'm here on behalf of Local 79's business manager, Mike Prohaska. Uh, Local 79 represents over 8,000 members working in construction in New York City, including the renewable energy sector. So we're very involved in the Carbon Free and Healthy Schools campaign, which Tori is going to present to you today. Uh, this initiative is a concrete plan that will help tackle the climate crisis, uh, creating good union jobs, as well as the apprenticeship programs that Santos talked about, and benefit our community while addressing economic inequality. So thank you for your uh, time and consideration. Thank you, Beth. Donald, you want to introduce yourself? Good morning, my name is Donald Nesbitt. I am the Executive Vice President for Local 372, uh, DC37. Uh, we represent 24,000 members in schools from the school crossing guard to the school aid, uh, family workers, school lunch employees, uh, our community titles, which include the parent coordinators and our uh, substance abuse prevention and intervention specialists um, in schools. Uh, we support as a union of climbing jobs, uh, New York, uh, carbon free and uh, healthy school initiative. Um, because simply put, um, before being elected to office, I was a cook in the New York City school system. And we experienced what a lot of people don't know. We experienced um, very high temperatures um, in the summertime in our kitchens, uh, temperatures that sometimes exceed 130 degrees, 140 degrees. Um, this is an initiative that we feel it's, it's a safety issue. Um, and um, it, for the workers, um, our students are, are also in those cafeterias, right? And experience this extreme heat, um, not only in the summertime, but also, you know, in the wintertime where you think it may be much cooler, it is also hot in these areas. Uh, we think that this is a great opportunity where we can address public safety as well. Uh, when you talk of the change from the school to prison pipeline, um, the reality is not all students are going to have entrance in college, right? Uh, certainly we wanna push them in that direction, but not all students are going to be um, interested in going, to, going into college and things of that nature. Uh, we think that this initiative can not only provide training, uh, but good union jobs for our students as they exit the school environment. Um, they'll be able to give back to their communities and to their schools 
with, with solar panels, building solar panels at, in our schools and different things um, associated with this initiative. And we just think this is a great opportunity. Thank you all. Thank you, Donald. Um, Kevin? You're on mute. You need to unmute. Kevin Jefferson, 32 BJ, District Leader, District 2 in the Chinatown District also. And also, Donald, I, I agree with you. I work in the school building. Cafeteria is extremely hot. That can be rectified. They did put air conditioning in some of them, but they don't last long. So they would have to modify the heat content that the AC pushes out and takes in at the same time. We're also very happy to be a part of the climate control system that you guys are working on. Happy to be here. And last but not least, Nishanta. Thank you, Tori. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Nishanta Lamont. I'm the Associate Director of Governmental and Political Affairs at CSA, which is the Council of School Supervisors and Administrators, the collective bargaining unit for um, school administrators across New York City, as well as um, administrators in early childhood centers um, subsidized by New York City. Um, I just want to say the CSA is proud to partner with this coalition um, in an effort to make our schools healthier and safer. And I do want to note that when schools shut down as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, there have been ongoing conversations and concerns about how we welcome our students back to the buildings in an environment that is safe, is, is healthy, conducive to learning, and a way that aids their overall health and well-being. And so um, you know, I think this is really a way to address those concerns, this initiative, because it's environmentally sound, um, it checks all the boxes, and we all heard the slogan, build back better. I think that's what we need to do here, whether that relates to our school culture, the curriculum, and most definitely the infrastructure. And so with the use of federal dollars, this is an opportune time for us to do that and a way to do right by our school communities, communities at large by creating good green jobs, union jobs, and taking care of the environment. So as school leaders, CSA really has a responsibility to advocate for resources and uh, effective ways to improve school communities that are entrusted in our care. So we will continue to stand with this coalition and to see it through, so thank you. Great. Um, thank you, everyone. I will hop right into the presentation. And I know um, we don't have a ton of time, so um, I won't be going over every single word. We can share it for um, everybody to take a look at more in depth on their own later. Um, I do want to leave some time for, for questions. Um, all right. So, um, Heard from some of our uh, coalition uh, partners, uh, our affiliates, we, it is comprised of the Building Trades, the New York City Central Labor Council, UFT, um, the CSA, DC 37, 32 BJ, and laborers. Um, similar coalitions to Climate Jobs New York have been formed in states throughout the country, um, including Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Illinois. Um, Carbon Free and Healthy Schools is a campaign that is centered on environmental and social justice and equity, um, going beyond just reducing emissions and improving air quality in our communities and our schools. It aims to provide the young people of New York City with opportunities, especially those in neighborhoods that have been historically overlooked and under-resourced. Um, and you've heard uh, some, some mention of those apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship programs today. Uh, and we have an unprecedented opportunity with the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act um, last year, which I'll get into some more of the numbers and details of that, um, to take advantage of significant federal and state funding sources um, to invest in New York City schools. So by investing in schools, um, uh, in terms of doing deep energy efficiency retrofits, as well as solar installations. Um, and down the road, uh, we do also have um, in the, the plans um, battery storage um, for resiliency. Um, we can create 45,000 good union jobs, make schools healthier and safer. 
uh, take on climate change and help the city meet its emissions reductions uh, targets under local law 97 um, by decreasing carbon emissions by 75,000 tons annually or the equivalent of taking 154,000 cars off the road and save um, approximately $275 million per year in energy costs, uh, which is the second highest cost in the DOE, which is also a trend we see nationally as well. Um, with the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, we as a coalition are seeking a commitment from the city to the acceleration of solar installation on New York City school buildings to 150 schools per year, as well as conducting energy efficiency retrofits um, with the completion of all schools uh, by 2030. Um, and then also doing this work, uh, com conducting the retrofits and solar installation under project labor agreements, um, because strong labor standards will ensure these opportunities for and increase access to uh, the pre-apprenticeship direct entry programs and apprenticeships for New Yorkers from uh, communities uh, that need it most. So in the, um, we have been meeting with the administration um, and in the latter part of 2022 at the request of the former first deputy mayor, uh, we shared a list of a hundred schools um, across all five boroughs to prioritize forced solar installation and energy efficiency building retrofits. And I will go through those numbers um, right now, uh, particularly for Manhattan. Um, all schools are located in environmental justice areas. 71 of the schools have uh, been determined by DCAS to be solar ready. Um, so they wouldn't need roof upgrades or repairs uh, in order to install solar panels. And then the additional 29 are schools that um, would require some, some work on the roofs um, in order to uh, install the solar panels. And I just wanna note and underscore um, that uh, this list is a recommendation of where to start um, initially. And the goal of the entire campaign is to ultimately have a multi-year plan that will allow for the completion of the retrofits and installations on every single um, school building uh, by 2030. So just uh, one of the examples of the schools um, on the list for Manhattan, PS126, um, have some of the details. Um, the estimated solar capacity is just under 176 um, kilowatts. Uh, and then some of the cost estimates for upgrades to the HVAC, the roof would be about $7 million. Um, LED retrofits, windows, solar installation would be just over 600,000 with a total estimated cost of 8.6 million. Um, it uses mostly fluorescent lighting. Uh, the heating controls aren't working and the roof is leaking and needs to be replaced. So the, throughout the five boroughs, um, the total cost for the 100 schools, I'm sorry about that, um, would be just under $330 million. And in Manhattan, we um, are recommending 18 schools to be prioritized. Um, which would the solar cost of solar installation would be 6.3 six, $6.7 million um, with the total estimated cost with the retrofits of uh, just under 82 million. And I won't read through every single one of these, um, but we do have listed all 18 schools and we can share, as I said, we'll share, share all of this information, this presentation and this information um, after. I will note uh, in where it says roof project, when we shared this list with the SCA, they did um, go through the entire list of 100 schools and uh, got back to us with which roof projects were either in construction or in design. Um, so the ones that say project in construction at the time uh, in the summer, um, those roofs were under construction. Inflation Reduction Act. Um, so this this was uh, really exciting um, and a surprise to I think most most everyone uh, that the Inflation Reduction Act was passed um, last year, and it comes with a substantial opportunity that we believe the city. Um, has a responsibility to take advantage of. Um, so in it, the direct pay credits for the in, the income tax credits 
um, for municipalities and nonprofits, uh, we estimate, so for all of the school buildings um, to get retrofitted and have solar installation where possible, um, we estimate that it would be for solar, it would be one point, uh, sorry, <laughs> for solar, it would be 3.3 um, billion, 1.32 billion or 40% of the cost would be uh, funded through the IRA. Um, and then for the remaining retrofits, it would be 5.15 billion total and 20% of that or 1.03 billion uh, would be provided through the IRA. Um, with a total direct pay credit of $2.35 billion, uh, which is pretty significant, um, and an energy cost savings over 30 years of 8.25 billion. And we um, have also on the right-hand side, um, an example of 150 school buildings, uh, since we're calling for the acceleration of solar installation to 150 school buildings per year, of um, what it would cost to just do the solar installation. So 150 schools, um, we would it would be just under uh, 50 million dollars. So it would be like a 50 million dollar bridge loan. Um, you'd get 19.2 million in tax credits from the IRA. There's also some other um, NYSERDA rebates and incentives. Um, we project <clears throat> that the annual solar revenue would be $2.9 million and the annual loan payments would be $2.05 million. So you would be outpacing your loan payments um, with cost savings and that the payback period would be four years. And then over 30 years, you would save $44.1 million. And that would have a job creation of 185 um, jobs. Uh, but again, that's exclusively solar. Wanted to touch on the workforce development component of it because we do view this as a green jobs initiative. Um, and uh, I know Santos mentioned the Apprenticeship Readiness Collective, the four uh, pre-apprenticeship programs that the Building Trades um, works with. He is a graduate of C-Skills, which provides training and direct entry access to New York City Public High School seniors. Um, and there's also, there, there is already a partnership um, between C-Skills and the DOE. Um, new, which is non-traditional employment for women, Helmets to Hard Hats, which provides direct entry program um, assistance for active duty veterans, National Guard, and reservists um, in transitioning into careers in the trades. And then Pathways to Apprenticeship, which is a direct entry pre-apprenticeship program, um, which recruits, trains, and mentors people from low-income communities for placement uh, into um, apprenticeship programs. And then, um, you know, I think a lot of people think electricians when they think solar installation, um, but with the entire comprehensive program, we have building retrofits, we have solar installation, um, there, and there's you know a number of different trades that would um, be employed uh, and help build up the um, retro building retrofit workforce uh, in preparation for upcoming work to meet local law 97 requirements in New York City, which we think is. Uh, uh, an important component that this can kickstart um, the preparation for that demand on the workforce. And that is the end of my presentation. Um, so any questions? Um, I see one in the chat is the list of proposed first 100 schools available publicly. Um, we shared it with uh, the SEA and the mayor's office. We didn't share it publicly, but we can we can share the list um, in addition to the Manhattan schools um, after this for for everybody's review. Thank, thanks, Tori. Um, just a couple additional questions for you. So uh, you guys are. Um, I, I a quick look at the map. It looks like you were primarily looking at schools to prioritize in Upper Manhattan. It looks like CB, maybe CB twelve, CB nine, CB eleven, and then depending on maybe like one or two or or something down 
I was just looked at the map quickly, quickly. Yeah, there's, um, there's, I know there's definitely one in Chinatown. Um, but it, the, the majority of them are in Northern Manhattan. Um, just based on, you know, as I said, 71 of them are solar ready, um, mm -hmm. so that we can go in quickly and knock that out, um, and start the cost savings. Um, and I can, pull up the map again, if that would be helpful. Well, just a follow-up question then, would it be um, in terms of your next steps and, and how community boards could possibly get involved in this or help support, um, would it, have you uh, been able to connect with our various boards to do like specific uh, presentations uh, at the boards that would be most directly impacted yet? Yes, so we um, have presented to uh, CB12's um, Health and Environmental Committee, as well as their Youth and Education Committee. Um, I believe Jean has been reaching out to CB11, um, but yes, that is a part of um, what we're what we're doing is we're um, you know presenting to everyone here, um, but also we uh, are doing direct presentations to the community boards that would be directly impacted by this specific list of a hundred. Perfect. Um, so I would just say, um, unless anybody has any other questions, I see Paul's on. So Paul was probably your your Chinatown uh, guy. Um, go ahead, Paul. Well, Andy Catherine is definitely a city three. Uh, so there's definitely a few schools I saw on that list that we probably would be interested in getting a presentation on in for CB3, because I just saw like little blotch of little dots right there. So it seems like there's a few schools down on Lower East Side, East Village. Gym. So, yep. so we can work something out and get a presentation for, for uh, our board. Absolutely. And I'll pop my email in the chat in case anybody wants to get in touch. So, thanks, Paul. So I would say if there's anything that we can do, and I know Xavier's on too from CB11. Um, I would say that if there's... Um, um, I, I will look towards uh, Paul... Catherine, Xavier, um, to let us know if, if and when I assume their boards would, would get on board with something like this. It sounds like a great, a great and no brainer opportunity to um, up, upgrade our schools and create good jobs and, and be more environmentally sound. Uh, so uh, we'll look to see those boards and see um, the, any resolutions that they get passed. Also, Barry, I'm not sure how far down it goes, but if there's some in and CB9 as well, we'll look to you all. And um, if you guys are passing resolutions on this, I see no problem in, in bringing this back to borough board for a full board vote um, once the boards uh, go through their you know, appropriate review and, and give us feedback as well. Great. Gene, uh, you wanted to say something? Just, yeah, just real quick. Uh, first of all, just a thank you again, Tricia and the staff of the borough president. Um, for your help in, in uh, preparing us to have this presentation opportunity. Uh, wanted to mention that uh, the key underpinning of our strategy connects to the, the data that 70% of all the carbon emissions in New York City come from buildings, 70. And a big component of that are the New York City school buildings, uh, about one quarter of which were built in the early part of the 20th century. So the energy and efficiency is huge. Uh, the cost of energy in the New York City school systems is the second largest cost. It's about $275 million a year. So this proposal that we're initiating is uh, a taxpayer friendly proposal, as well as cutting emissions and improving the educational environment for our students learning. Uh, the second part I just wanted to mention um, is that this is an ambitious plan. This is a big ask. And we need over time, the sustained support of every level of the New York City uh, political institution, the mayor, the community boards, the borough boards, the city council members, all the activists. I mean, it's a, as you can hear from the numbers that Tori talked about, uh, these are not small amounts, but they are investments that pay off over time. So we have a resolution, one of our tools that we put together. It's sort of a template 
And uh, I have uh, I've already been sharing it with the staff of the borough president. But for example, we need to have that resolution circulated and passed. You can modify it somewhat to your, you know, your own particular neighborhood or political gathering. But that resolution being passed needs to be communicated to the mayor, to the community, to the city council members. And we'll be uh, giving that to your staff, Tricia, your colleagues, uh, to help us get it circulated. And uh, thank you again, everybody. This is an ongoing program. Uh, it's a great way for New York City to demonstrate its commitment to what is New York City doing about climate change? This is a major example of what we're trying to develop. And it benefits us on so many ways, including the, the new industry and the new jobs that'll be created that we want them to be union scale, union benefit. And uh, that's what we're trying to do. So thank you. <laughs> that's my two cents. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Jean. And happy to share anything that you all send us. Um, so uh, again, Tori, if there's um, anybody who after this, you would like us to help connect you with directly, we're happy to. And um, I'm sure this is not the last time we'll, we'll be talking about this. No, certain, certainly not, especially since it's going to be a multi-year you know, effort to, to get it done. We need to have sustained support for it. Um, and I will just say, you know, uh, there are some much smaller school districts um, in certain parts of the country, um, notably one in, in Texas that has, um, you know, installed solar and they've used the cost savings to increase teacher salaries. So it is, you know, it is money, sustained cost savings and even revenue that um, should uh, be put back into the schools. And I know that with continuing budget conversations of the schools, um, you know, it is one one good option for the near future that should be considered. Thank you all so much. And thank you to everybody, uh, all of our brothers and sisters in labor who, sh who came to this morning's meeting. We really appreciate you being here. Um, thank you. Okay, we're gonna uh, move on then to uh, chair reports. The only thing I wanna say just before we, um, just before we uh, uh, go through, um, our various boards is just, I wanted to reiterate um, that we do have the State of the Borough coming up on January 31st. Um, I have yet to see all of you in person, most of you in person, and uh, barring any sort of sickness um, on anybody's end, I, I certainly plan on being there myself. So I would uh, just want to reiterate, I know that there's a lot of good reasons and it'll be wonderful to, to kind of hear uh, the big up updates from our borough president. But if we're, but on top of everything else, I would just love to see you all. So I hope that you I hope that you uh, have have the time and have the ability to join us. If not, we'll certainly find another time to do so this year. But um, I hope that you would consider and um, and would uh, also just uh, reiterate to to our other board members and to other community members uh, in the various districts that we do have the state of the borough happening on January thirty first, and I would love nothing more than to see um, our community boards there. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it over to uh, CB1. It's January. Oh, and um, and yeah, it's January. So happy, uh, happy January. And hi, Tammy. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thanks very much. I think going first is always really nerve wracking. So I appreciate everybody for every other month. Thank you very much. It's top of the top of the year for you. So happy new year. <laughs> Um, I want to say first and foremost to thank you to everybody. It's uh, looking forward for a great year. Um, we passed resolutions on last mile logistics because it's super important for us to figure out ways to get all the packages and everything off the streets. I know this is something that's shared in many of my other community boards um, as I walk around and visit their locations, but we passed a resolution looking at alternative ways of moving cargo with last mile logistics, including opening up spaces in, for example, accessory garages where there's space and allowing them to be able to have sealed places to get them off the sidewalks and off the streets, super important. Uh, last month, we also reviewed the Trust for Governor's Island um, RFP. We had unprecedented access uh, to at least some of it, which we could have seen more because it is, you know, the island for the city for play um as it transforms 
we passed a resolution this month for, with working with the public restroom working group um, and more details to come on that I appreciate everybody will send that around um, as they're going from board to board to board. Um, we also did a resolution on the joint purpose fund from Battery Park City. So the city itself uses funding and overage that comes from Battery Park City into the city. This is a unique opportunity that we have that was always designed for that to be used for affordable housing, to be able to support affordable housing in areas where they tell us it's too expensive and you have to do other things. We're talking about $100 million a year or more that could go into helping sustain parts of the city that have been gentrified out of it being affordable to build affordable housing. It's really important that we build a city that's representative of all of us. And this is one of the pathways that we can work on. So we ask our, our elected officials and the controller's office to really try and take a look at what happens with that money and see if we can really reinvent the city using it. I also wanted to say we passed a resolution unanimously supporting our colleagues in CB6 and intro 1724 for city council to put cameras on the stop arms of buses. We thought that was really amazing, especially on the tight little streets that we have with people kind of trying to squeeze around. So it's something that could be going to every community board and for helpful. Um, and then for preliminary budget, we really hope that the mayor's preliminary budget gets closer what the collective priorities are for the communities and the people and that they really work to be able. So when the executive budget comes out, the real needs are met. It's sort of unconscionable to me that you wouldn't fund something like a library, which serves a constituency for socioeconomically diverse from infants to elderly. I mean, we really need to hope that we can look at the budgets, opine on the budgets, and instead of cutting off whole arms, maybe you're trimming nails on the ends of every little agency and budget so we can all have something versus massive slashes. Um, and then I think at the end of this, we have a long month ahead of us and a long year ahead of us to work on things like public bathrooms that go through every community board um, noise which i'm so appreciative of the conversation commentary our noise issues come prior are a slightly different tweak because they come off the water with the boats versus necessarily on the streets but you know again every single little bit that we can do together as a group and come to some sort of synergy is really helpful for moving the city forward to serve more people. And with that, I say thank you and happy new year to all. Thanks, Tammy. Happy new year. And Tammy, you just reminded me, um, just a little reminder to everybody, I was gonna say this at the end too, but um, speaking of budget, uh, uh, per the uh, New York City Charter, we will have a, a, a opportunity to hear from more folks about budget and I will be looking uh, for any sort of budget resolutions that your boards are passing so that we can pass something collectively at borough board. Um, my, my hope is for February. So um, uh, keep just FYI, we're going to be looking for that, um, looking for those documents and looking for your feedback on, on there as well. Um, more to come on that, but thank you, Tammy, for reminding me. You're um, and, for, and for bringing it up. Uh, next, we'll go to CB2 for with Janine. Good morning, happy new year, everyone. Um, on an update on local issues, um, we had a vibrant um, discussion Tuesday night and OTI uh, on, on 5G and OTI actually came and attended um, and they gave a short presentation. They, um, and um, we sort of asked the tough questions as a, a the committee and then opened it up to public comment. It's a short meeting, it's less than an hour and a half and um, I can share the YouTube link if people want that. You can speed it up and watch it at whatever speed you want. Um, our board will be passing, will be voting on a resolution tonight that the committee unanimously passed, um, similar to um, what we saw, um, what, what the borough president's letter um, said. Um, but please take a look at it. Um, I'm just putting that in there. Um, and um, second, um, Cannabis, cannabis, cannabis. Um, 
there, the, the, there is a website that has a list of legal sites in New York State. And as of today, there's one. Um, so when people are calling in to your office and asking if such and such site is legal, I think it would be helpful to provide this website link, um, which I also will share. Um, the only one that is officially opened is um, the housing work site that opened um, before the holidays. Um, and, um, and, and there's gonna be a second one opening in community board two next week, details to come. Um, but I think it's important to, you know, people like, yeah, I've seen things on listservs and chats Oh, why don't why don't we have a voice in this? And it's because it's illegal. <laughs> and you, so um, I think it would be it's important for us to help get that message out. I I do know from temporarily running the district service cabinet meeting that of, of the four precincts um, in CB two, one had a major um, bust outside the sheriff's issue in terms of an illegal. Uh, a legal opening. So I think it's just something, to, it's an information thing that we need to keep our communities aware of. Um, CB2 had its first um, asylum shel oh, shelter open over right, right before the new year at 231 Grand Street. There's 208 families um, and we've spread throughout our, shared throughout our community and will continue to do so. Um, PS 130 got more than 40 kids. Um, and that was a week ago, so that number may have gone up. And they have an Amazon wish list. Um, Council member Chris Marte's office is collecting new and gently used clothes and dropping them off at their office downtown. And um, and, and then the um, the families are just coming by to pick up clothes. And Welcome to Chinatown is hosting a, a GoFundMe fundraiser um, for for these residents, um, which and there's a in conjunction with Council member Marte's office. So. Um, I'm happy to share those links. Um, and the big news in CB2 is we have a new district manager, Mark Diller. Many of you may know him. He's um, former chair of CB7. He's a member of CB7. He started on Tuesday, late yesterday. He got his official CB2 email or maybe early this morning. Um, so the pro, so, and you know, it's starting him, you know, we have our full board meeting tonight. So um, <laughs> throwing him into the fire of the first week. Um, so uh, that is sort of the main the main issues going on in community board too. So thank you. Congratulations, Janine. Oh my God, it's been- I am thrilled. <laughs> oh, actually I do wanna raise one issue and I will be reaching out to, um, you know, human resources, um, but an important issue, um, you know, we keep financials for the community boards, but there's a major issue of um, unused leave balance time, which is, an off balance sheet liability. And I would think it would be helpful if the borough president's office could come up with a way um, for all of us to track that on a quarterly basis or some other basis by employee, um, because we are essentially, we have, we have four employees and I know some offices are even smaller. Um, so we, uh, when somebody retires and has a significant leave balance or remains on the payroll for a couple of months, that really does impact the board's ability to um, hire someone new and it really handcuffs the board. It's not like a giant city agency with thousands of employees. Um, so um, I think this is a very important issue, very minutia, but critical um, because if you have, um, basically it's an off balance sheet liability and board members need to track it um, and the personnel committee needs to make sure that people are, are not accruing large balances that will come back to essentially um, bite the board when somebody retires or moves to a new job. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, a really good point. Um, we, we've been talking a little bit about this. We talked, uh, touched on it a, a bit last year when we did onboarding for new board members. And we're talking about just trying to reemphasize to them the role of Kind of managing an office that it t you take on when you uh, become a board member and you don't really realize that. But um, I will go back to our HR folks and see what we can uh, see some ideas on how we can support you guys in this way. But it's a, a thank you because I think it's more of an issue for the chair. I mean, only when only when you become a chair do you approve timesheets for the district manager, at least in our office. So you're completely unaware of it, and we do need an accounting of it. Um, because it, it's not going to show up in our financials. It's like a pension liability, or something. Uh, but it's a real liability. 
Yeah, Tammy. Uh, we dealt with somewhat of a similar thing when we had turnover a couple of years ago. I do think that if there was some kind of, since we submit the timesheets, if there was like a quarterly update that you could get back, that um, that would be really, really helpful because that would help you as you come into the months where you know that the community board is not meeting, whether it's July or August, and, and working with your team to ask them to start taking some of their time if they so desire, if it works for them, but it, it gives you a way to help manage so you are not so caught unaware and having to wait three to six months or more um, on occasion to be able to hire somebody. Yeah, um, I I was wondering if Tommy was going to weigh in on this and Tommy's got her hand raised. So go ahead. Tom, go ahead, Tommy. Um, yeah, thanks for that. I, I just want to um, say that it's fine for you guys to have awareness about leave balances, but I do want to caution against, um, you know, in discouraging folks from using time or trying to push people to use time when they don't want to use it because of these leave balances. Um, you know, many of these terms are governed by um, union contracts and or, um, you know, citywide leave policies. So um, I, I just want to be cautious that, yes, you should have an awareness, but, um, you know, there are also uh, rules around when and how you can ask employees to take their time. Go ahead, Vicki. Tricia, if I could just ask Janine, is this the Mark Diller from Board 7 who was the former chair? Yes, it is oh. that Mark Diller. <laughs> fabulous. Just fabulous. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, you you really made a great choice. Um, and I'm looking forward to, um, I'm, I was going to send him an email, but uh, since Andrew is away for the next two days, um, I will I will just send him an email and tell him that I can't wait to see him next week for Borough Service Cabinet. But you'll have a great meeting tonight, I'm sure. Okay, thanks. Uh, moving on to uh, Paul, CB3. Uh, good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. And uh, I feel time is I never like to be the lead off of it. Uh, or right now, I'm moving, so I understand. So I'll skip March. I'm ready for her. Uh, in this case, uh, so just a little something about board service. I believe last time uh, we brought up was you know, to be open the streets and you need to push for 60 days uh, notification as opposed to 30 days for the community boards. And uh, in that, I, I don't, um, it's a dance program I can manage about. So uh, I think 60 days notification would be preferable for boards. I was on board, I'm speaking to that. Um, and in terms of getting uh, items onto the agenda, I have to get the streets. Um, Speaking of cannabis, uh, we had our first uh, task force meeting. I chose not to go with the committee route. I chose to go with the task force route. And we were very singular in this one application that came to us a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and we, uh, we uh, the task force uh, chose to support the license from the different legislation that will eventually be voted on before the next so we're going to talk about that. Um, also, the, the comments to OCM are due by February 12th, I believe. Um, so we're going to share our comments uh, with our other boards that we've seen by this and share their comments. And we go to our OCM and their regulations. I think something that's come up big for us is uh, a, a potential 500 foot rule away from drug treatment centers. As it seems to be a big thing that's been, uh, that came up on uh, our application. So it's something we're thinking about commenting on and saying to us again. Uh, we're going to vote on that tonight with executive right, on our common city division and eventually full board on Tuesday night. Uh, our parks committee will be doing no increase resolution. I think they supported it uh, the last week and they will come to our full board before night. Thanks so much, Paul. Um, I just, I, you're a little hard of hearing, but I think I got most of that. I just want to make sure that I, for anybody who may have missed the bottom part of that. So I got the 60 days instead of 30 days. I got the cannabis. I got the February 12th OCM comments there. And, and I just couldn't hear anything else at the very end. Um, if you, no injuries right now. It passed the uh, parts committee. It's going to come in front of full board on um, Tuesday. Perfect. Perfect. Thank. Thanks so much, Paul. 
Yeah. Well, Chris gets in my Sorry. Don't worry, you're fine. Um, now, I think Jeffrey um, had uh, the same meeting uh, with uh, the NYPD that uh, our borough president was going to, so he had to leave early. So next we'll go to Vicki uh, and CB5. Okay. Happy 2023 to everyone. It's good to see you all. Um, we started the year uh, on a very good note because we uh, approved modifications for two special permits for a POPs and public arcade um, for the Park, Parker Meridian Hotel on West 56th Street. So this is the block that contains the avenue that everybody knows as Six and a Half Avenue. Um, the new owner agreed to a huge number of changes to the POPs and they were all positive and to the benefit of the public. It was wonderful. But the most important uh, agreement for the public use uh, was restrooms that were previously uh, used for hotel guests only. They agreed um, that they would be for the public. They are not within the boundaries of either the through block arcade or the plaza, and they will in effect be used as an additional public safety, um, public space and amenity. Uh, so we, along with uh, other boards, have long been advocating, as you all know and do, for an increase in the number of clean, safe public restrooms in our districts, and we saw this as a very special accomplishment. Uh, we authorized the use of office space from Manhattan South Traffic Enforce Enforcement Unit for the expansion of personnel, and that is uh, they will be located on West 30th Street. We had a lively discussion at both our Parks Committee and at the full board regarding NYC OTI and the City Bridges proposal for uh, the 5G, the Link 5G towers in our district. And basically what we decided uh, was to disapprove the installation of any in CB5. And we requested a moratorium be placed on construction and planning the Link 5G poles and devices in our district. Lastly, in December, um, we established our cannabis task force. And then just last night, our state licenses and permits committee held an informational open meeting regarding adult use cannabis. And the Office of Cannabis Management sent three reps to address our questions and concerns. Um, just as a reminder that the open public comment period began on December 13th and ends on February 13th. Um, that's it for CB5, thank you. Thank you so much, Vicki. And <clears throat> thank you to your members, uh, as well as the other members of two and four, and I think six, um, all the folks who've been working on public restrooms in particular. It's just been a really, it's been a wonderful thing to, to watch the kind of inner, um, the collaboration between boards on a very worthwhile issue. Um, next we'll go to Kyle in CB6. Good morning, everybody. Hope everyone had a happy, happy new year. Um, very quick report. Um, so first of all, just want to thank the borough president and the rest of the uh, staff for supporting CB6 and trying to reclaim some green space uh, near the East Midtown Tunnel, um, just some space that belongs to the MTA, I believe, and um, has just sort of been dormant for a very long time, but could be of a um, big benefit um, to one of the districts, with the lowest amount of green space in the city. So really appreciate that. And we'll continue to monitor the progress on that. Um, furthermore, uh, similar to many other community boards, we're very focused on cannabis enforcement, particularly around schools uh, and um, advertising to children. So um, three of our committees are actually working together, youth and education, health and human services, as well as business affairs, um, to put together a resolution um, highlighting our particular areas of concern when it comes to the enforcement. And then last but not least, I'm sure everyone is aware of the assembly map redistricting. Um, we passed a resolution last week. Um, it seems like Groundhog Day because we've gone through this for many other different types of redistricting um, parts of um, our district, as well as to the north and CB8, are being grouped in with Queens again. Um, so we passed that resolution, and I will be uh, testifying at the February 7th hearing uh, at Hunter College. So, yeah, that's it for CB6. Perfect. Thanks, Kyle. And congratulations. I think you have the most 
the the fastest and most efficient board meeting uh, of January thus far. <laughs> yes, we did. Yeah, very uh, very happy about it. And then we had a very efficient uh, exec committee meeting last night. Yeah, you guys are. Uh, we talk we talk in our office about the board meetings and about how they go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks. Uh, next, we'll go to Beverly and CB Seven. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, we have a lot of work in progress, um, not so much in the way of finished resolutions to report. Um, we're tracking closely the proposal for converting vacant newsstands to charging stations for the deliveristas, uh, which passed the FCRC last week. Um, one of the three sites under consideration is Verde Square Park at Broadway and 72nd. Um, we have a lot of support for the concept, but concern about the impact on uh, Verde Park, which is uh, much beloved and has its own uh, rather squalid history as Needle, Needle Park. And we just wanna be sure all of the considerations on usage and uh, keeping it clean and not too overcrowded are kept in place. Um, we are, are immensely pleased with the uh, capital plan inclusion of 63 million for the Soldiers and Sailors Monument and all the associated plazas. And grateful to Gail Brewer and the cast of many who uh, worked so hard to put that into the budget. Um, next week, we're holding a joint Parks and Transportation Committee hearing on the opening of the Gilder Center at the Museum uh, of Natural History, which will be later this spring. Um, we wanted to give an opportunity to air community concerns on both uh, vehicular and pedestrian traffic and the impact on Theodore Roosevelt Park. And that will be on Monday. Um, and we're meeting with the uh, public library representatives regarding the, the cuts uh, that were included in the January plan to libraries. Um, many of the cuts in the plan that are difficult start next fiscal year, but the library cuts are included in the current uh, fiscal year. So we see that as really uh, critical, important, and immediate uh, work to address. Um, we also, at, on Monday's uh, hearing, will introduce a resolution in support of the Borough President's Million Trees Initiative, which will be voted at our full board on February 7th. And our Health and Human Services Committee is partnering with the Joan of Arc uh, Educational Complex, which recently uh, uh, had its scaffolding removed for the first time in seven years, now revealing um, a playground that's actually usable. And we're working on plans uh, for an inclusive playground uh, serving youth of all abilities in that new newly available space. Um, and we are really focusing on um, the affordable housing issues, both New York State's housing compact, which we're studying, plans for uh, looking at renewal of J51 and 421A, um, and at the items in the mayor's budget that begin to address some of the housing issues as well. And um, that's it. Thanks so much, Beverly. Uh, and I, I just want to say CB7 has a long history of uh, working towards creating inclusive playgrounds. I think it's absolutely wonderful. I used to chair my parks committee on CB8, and I, I just think it's so wonderful to see that you guys are continuing to do that. So I look forward to, to seeing the finished product. Uh, next, speaking of which, we'll go to Russell in CB8. Thank you. So I um, was very proud of the fact that our board meeting was, uh, our full board meeting last night was pretty fast. Also, it was uh, just over two hours. So uh, I think that's a record for us. Uh, and probably the most impressive thing I have to report today. But <laughs> um, we also, we've been continuing to work on the issue of the Link NYC 5G towers and really uh, advocate on that. And we really appreciate the borough president uh, sending the letter that he did and, and joining in on that fight and, and looking forward to working with the other boards potentially on uh, that issue because it sounds like it's now affecting the whole borough. Um, in addition, so last night we passed a resolution relating to parking placard abuse and calling for more enforcement and in particular for a centralized database 
and also that, that would make it easy to identify uh, parking placard abuses and also for empowering um, you know, traffic officers, the people who write ordinary parking tickets to enforce those rules. Uh, in addition, we passed a resolution relating to recommendations on marijuana regulations um, and uh, had a pretty, you know, a number of meetings on this and a comprehensive set of uh, our suggestions for, um, you know, how we can have a uh, meaningful community input uh, on these in the same way that, uh, you know, we do for liquor license applications and somewhat modeled on that process, but also sort of geared towards some of the particulars of uh, marijuana and so uh, focus on the sort of things that we're looking for there and, and making sure that they're able to operate, you know, legally and, and safely, but also in a way that's not going to be too appealing to children. And uh, also, you know, calling for additional enforcement related to the uh, illegal smoke shops that have cropped up and that a number of folks on the uh, in the meeting today have talked about. So those are sort of the highlights and uh, happy new year, everybody. I'll leave it there. And I wanted to just say welcome to, uh, to the new folks who were joining the meeting here. Thanks so much, Russell. Uh, next we'll go to CB9. Thank you, Tricia. Um, and again, also welcome to Marquise and to uh, Ms. Diaz, new chairs from Upper Manhattan. Uh, having quite the turnover, my term will end in June. So in July, you'll have a new face. Um, for CB9, but we have been very active um, over the winter holidays. Um, the uh, While we are still grappling with the rollout of the retail cannabis and unlicensed retail, retail cannabis, the Cannabis Control Board was taking um, public comment on their draft home grow cannabis regulations. So they are coming really fast with a raft of regulations covering a lot of different aspects. We submitted our public comment on that. Uh, notably, we did not think that the CCB um, took into account enough concerns about um, electrical and the potential for electrical or lamp-based fires uh, for our home grow op operations. For those who don't know, um, the the MRTA MRTA um, Act allowed for I think it's a, a substantial number of plants I want to say six um, to be grown for home use, um, but those frequently involve high intensity grow lights that um, you know with our fairly old housing stock may not have the appropriate electrical wiring to support that much load. Um, also, there is a concern for odor. Um, these plants smell very pungent and potent, and the smell um, could definitely become a nuisance for our neighbors or other folks in the building. And so um, the draft language of the regulations includes some sort of, you know, makes an attempt to control the odor, but there are kind of like charcoal-based and ozone-based systems available that do a much better job neutralizing it. And we'd like them to be more specific about the amount of odor that could be controlled. It's also not clear whether, you know, this would be grounds for, you know, having, you know, nuisance as a tenant and potential eviction. So we don't think they've addressed some of those issues as clearly as they could or should. Um, uh, we are holding a public hearing uh, toward the end of this month on for our um, comment on the mayor's preliminary budget. Um, we are concerned about some of the cuts there and we'll be meeting with kind of the affected agencies to understand how they would specifically impact our district. Um, we are also passing a letter of support for a large DDC capital project that spans DOT and DEP to repair a collapse segment of 12th Avenue. That collapse occurred in 2018 before I was chair, so it's taken them this long to really get the project scoped out, but there was a sewer and stormwater interceptor under the street that collapsed. The area had a lot of drainage issues prior to that, and we're trying to make them fix it correctly this time when they're pouring millions of dollars into doing that. Um, and then um, we also passed a letter for public comment to OTI about the 5G towers. Um, to us, it was really notable that the reason that they are 
citing these towers is to bail out a private company that runs Link NYC. You know, we think that poor public design and use of street space should not be done simply for the private benefit of one company. Uh, there's plenty of public sites for these um, antennas to go up that would not, you know, have the same aesthetic impact and would not take up as much street real estate. And then um, finally, uh, I was present yesterday for the announcement of the new president of Columbia University, um, Dr. Manu Shafiq, who um, we are hoping will be a change of pace in the president's office at Columbia towards the way they deal with the surrounding community, including CD9, where there have been a number of kind of struggles over the decades um, regarding especially real estate, but also, you know, how well community outreach and engagement is conducted. Um, and so that's something that we're going to be continuing to work on. Um, and I will send around the home grow um, comment on the proposed rules and regs, Tammy. Thanks, Barry. Thanks. Um, Barry, uh, you just reminded me um, of a request. Um, if any if any of the boards have any do pass resolutions on cannabis, um, regardless of how if it's about a specific uh, a specific application or if it's just more generally about the rules, we'd love to make sure that we get copies of all of that as well. I think you all are, but if you could please just resend them over to the community liaison for your boards um, and you can CC me as well, it would just be great for us to make sure that we get copies of every of everything. Um, and Barry, you remind me, I noticed this. So it's, isn't, I don't know, Janine, Janine if C and NYU has announced their new president, but I think it's like Columbia, NYU, Hunter, um, at a minimum, are the three that are all going to see new leadership this year. Columbia announced yesterday. And NYU yep. has to go yet, right? Will be, but it has, I don't think it Okay, so just and and also frankly, the Museum of Natural History just got new leadership. I see a lot of like new leadership uh, in terms of like the big institutions and that sort of thing. So it just maybe you know good to share. And I I'm interested in in kind of seeing seeing that as well. And um, so please keep us posted if you if you hear anything else. Yep. The the one other item of note that I forgot was that tonight we're running another hybrid in person virtual meeting. Um, so not strictly required yet, um, but it's been useful to us to have like a number of these practices. This will be in a Columbia space at the forum. It will not be the big auditorium, but a smaller room. Um, so I think we're setting up our own AV again, but just getting those reps under our belt so that we know that we can do this for real when um, when we're required to. Um, so I will I will provide notes on how it goes, but the owls from former Grow President Gail Brewer have been very helpful in like just giving us something to plug in that works pretty well as a speaker, microphone, and camera. Thank you so much, Barry, and good luck. You guys are are doing a great job with those. Thanks. Uh, next are our brand new chair for CB10, Marquise. Good morning, uh, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for um, everyone's kind words and welcoming me. Um, this is uh, my first borough board meeting, and so I'm new to it, but I've, I've been listening a lot and I'm learning a lot as I'm listening. So I've been taking notes on what other boards are doing and um, hopefully we'll learn a lot from those of you who have been in this role uh, for some time. Um, just a quick, I, I've been on the board since 2012, Community Board 10. And so this has been a long, I'm a teacher as well. Um, and I work for the teachers union. So I look forward to uh, sharing with all of you monthly or and certainly in between meetings, um, going forward. Uh, I did have my first board meeting in January uh, this past month, a few weeks ago. Um, and I was, I think I was happy with the time. It was about two and a half hours. So that wasn't too bad. Um, we have a, we have a problem with time. Um, we passed one resolution at this board meeting um, and it was around some uh, semiconductor legislation, something called the CHIPS Act of 2022. Um, which was a bipartisan law focusing on federal aid to encourage construction of microprocessor manufacturing facilities in the uh, United States. Uh, we wanted, we were advocating our resolution advocates for some of that funding uh, to be funneled explicitly to Central Harlem through education and workforce development programs to prepare Central Harlem residents, uh, which has historically been underserved uh, community 
uh, in, impacted by poverty uh, so that they will also be a part of some of those, some of that money that's being funneled through both the state and the city um, to help our uh, community. Um, also one heavily spoken about thing in our meeting was about the uh, 5G towers as well, uh, which we plan to have a public hearing in February about. Um, we, I, a public comment, um, they have held, um, I think they're gonna be coming as well to us um, and they've decided to hold off on any plans at this point until they have the public hearing through the community board. Um, a few events we have coming up on January 23rd, our housing committee will be hosting an education forum Focus on uh, NYCHA's preservation trust for our residents. We are also obviously dealing with uh, a lot of things with cannabis. Um, and so on January 26th, we plan to have a public comment session on a proposed dispensary um, slated for 125th Street in our board, which has uh, been very much talked about and in the news as well. Um, we are also still uh, currently dealing with, uh, at, you might have read in the news about 145th Street, um, so I walked into this situation where uh, there's a proposed, uh, or as of yesterday, I believe, open truck stop um, in, a, in a community where there, we would really need housing. Um, and so we're working to, again, we had passed several resolutions before against the truck stop. Um, we're calling, um, the borough president I recently is calling for housing to be developed in that area as well. Uh, we have certain conditions that we asked for in our resolution but we would like to obviously get back to the table to talk about how that area can be developed. Um, but that is also, that helps the communities be sustained and those residents that have traditionally been there also be welcomed into that housing. And so that's something that we really wanna focus on uh, going forth. Um, as the new chair, um, I've also uh, about to announce a new task force in regards to uh, creating a strategic plan for our board. It's something that we wanted to work on and go for going forth. Uh, we are also currently in the midst of reviewing our bylaws. These are just things that we are um, we do when we have turnover of the chair. Um, and so there are different groups. And we plan to announce some other new groups or potentially committees uh, looking to work with clergy in our community as well going forth. Um, so there's just a few things that we're looking at and working on in this past few weeks since becoming chair. Thanks so much, Marquise, and welcome again. Uh, Xavier, I, I admit, um, just before you speak, I actually was talking about you to Marquise um, earlier and recommended that he connect with you because I, I, I do really admire the way you start your meetings. Um, and I think that it's a great, um, a good best practice, honestly, to for uh, folks in terms of setting tone and and getting off on the right foot and that sort of thing. So I hope that you guys might connect and um, just share some of the stuff that's going on in CB11, which I think is, is done extremely well. Uh, thank you very much, Trish, and uh, welcome, Marquise. We'll, we'll grab that uh, cafecito and uh, <laughs> talk. And as as uh, Porfirio knows, flattery don't charge these batteries, Trish. So. Um, Welcome, Happy New Year. So glad to be in this space. I do want to say to all of my fellow chairs, it'd be great to have a social when you all feel comfortable, when we get into the warmer months and we can be outside. I know many of us have uh, battled COVID and uh, RSV, the flu, and those of us, whether your parents or not, know it can be right nasty. Uh, so with that, I'm going to kind of move as quickly as I can do uh, and elevate just some things that are affecting our community, affecting our borough, and also some citywide issues that have come to our attention at CB11. Uh, first, um, uh, DOHMH, we were discovered last week that Dr. McRae is no longer with the agency who was supposed to give us the numbers that were committed to by on point uh, as it comes to the people using the overdose prevention center um, and, and on 126. So far on point has declined to keep their commitment and we are continuing to chase that. Uh, they had said, yes, we'll give you all of the raw data so you can examine it and we'll have a deeper conversation. Um, they refused multiple times to provide that data uh, and including uh, the just the zip codes, um, those that are enrolling in recovery programs, and the attrition rates. It's a very simple data, so we can actually help uh, solve many of the problems affecting our community and whether or not this is something that uh, is impacting the city and that it's being drawn into the community. But uh, according to the records from the NYPD, we are finding that the majority of the zip codes that people are 
uh, especially when it comes to the dealers. Almost all of them are not from Community Board 11 and are new to the neighborhood. Um, so that is something we are chasing down and working with CAU at the moment, and they've been very responsive to it and have done a walkthrough with uh, both the, the BP staff uh, to see what's happening boots on the ground. Uh, the OCM, wow, well, we all seem to have this in common. Uh, uh, the We are having our executive committee tonight. We did have a meeting with Chris Alexander. He came into the community after months and months and months of asking and having meetings with uh, Uptown Task Forces. And uh, Marquise, just a quick aside, we should definitely have a phone call on that. Um, the we asked for an explanation of why they're not rolling this out like the state liquor authority process and many of the explanations um didn't have parallel modeling to what they were experiencing and justification for why they're doing uh they're exercising this this new model so for example they said that in new jersey people could be bribed um i don't think many of these outfits although they obviously have deep pockets to be able to replace all of the uh, cannabis products uh, I don't think they have enough money to bribe 50 board members um, when it comes to licensing. And, and plus, the other regulations uh, don't really align with that process. So there, there, there were a series of justifications that really didn't um, have parity when it comes to modeling for the process. We also explained that the SLA process is very uniform. Everyone understands it, how it should be rolled out. It also ensures safety and community engagement. Um, the other component too we raised to, to him was that we did have in this community in CB11, where there were two middle schoolers who did purchase cannabis products, uh, some gummies, some edibles here, and had an adverse reaction to it. Um, and according to our partners over at ABC, uh, Association to Benefit Children who have the contract for emotional disturbance and youth, um, they did respond in this community to address that. Uh, he did say on the positive side that if any organization, any outfit that is applying for a license or has a license and did not uh, and has sold to minors, they will shut them down immediately and revoke their license. However, that doesn't answer the question, which is how do we uh, um, stop the illegal outfits? That's really what we all boil down to, because again, we want all our businesses to thrive, especially in this community that's been disadvantaged from the war on drugs. But how do we do that in a way that reassures the community? And that extends to our conversation that will happen tonight, which also impacts NYCHA developments when it comes to home grow. Uh, so Barry, thank you for uh, sharing that. If you could get that across today, I can share with the committee. We will be weighing in on a resolution with that. Um, let's see right here. Da, da, da. We did a tour on the uh, Esplanade with the, uh, the peer revitalization. That's something that we have been advocating for for ages. Even Trish can <laughs> attest to that. Um, we'd like to see that entire loop going around Manhattan. Um, so that is something we're pushing heavily for. And we'd eventually long-term like to see a ferry service. Uh, that would be fantastic for that area. Uh, um, rezoning 2017, our uh, agreements, points of agreement, uh, Department of Sanitation, we have a temporary garage. And as you all know, something that is temporary often becomes permanent. We are taking a tour in the facility, but we really want a state of an art facility that was committed to and for DSNY to release those publicly held lots so we can develop affordable housing, as we heard from uh, uh, both our BP in the past and from Botcher and others that this, this it, had they kept their commitment, we could have affordable housing coming online in this district right now. Uh, the 125th Street Task Force that was headed by our council member, Deputy Speaker Ayala, is now morphed into a district-wide public safety, East Harlem Public Safety uh, meeting, which we'll be having next week uh, to address a lot of the public safety issues affecting this community. Um, I have more to report on that. I look forward to seeing the BP at 1130 for hopefully a very positive announcement that uh, we I was very intimately involved with, with Uptown Grand Central and others. So stay tuned for that news. Um, and one last bit, uh, we, and as many of you know, that uh, East Harlem has historically been uh, a, a, what we call the, the cradle, la cuna, for the Puerto Rican diaspora. Uh, previously well known was in Brooklyn, which when many of our, my, my family members came here, they either went to Brooklyn or the South Bronx or Spanish Harlem. Uh, you may have heard uh, over last week that they tried to remove in Brooklyn uh, Graham Avenue, Avenida de Puerto Rico, uh, and then there was immediately a backlash, and they put it back, and there has been yet to be an explanation as to why that has happened. Something that we raised uh, to the attention of Adonis Rodriguez is why during the announcement of Hispanic Heritage Month, uh, the medallion for Puerto Rico was not included. 
Uh, as many of uh, you may know, historically in New York, uh, uh, the Boricua people were the tip of the spear when it came into the New York City greater community. And so we've asked for explanation on that and to why there seems to be um, an unforced error at, at at best case, but at worst case, perhaps a even erasure. But we really are concerned about that and just how we're very proud. We're all sewn in together. And I think it's great for us to elevate one another in our contributions to this greater city. So this is just something that we can see as that affected one community now branched out to a larger community and then the greater city. So as my fellow chairs, I just ask you, you know, we tend to focus exclusively on our districts, but if we could all work together to recognize, as I tell, I'll leave you with this, as I teach my boys, recognize patterns, uh, use patterns, and then create patterns. And that is that is a key to successfully navigating uh, life. Um, so with that, I thank you all. Happy New Year. Happy Lunar New Year. And uh, stay safe out there. Thanks, Xavier. Uh, unfortunately, Kathy uh, Diaz, who's our new chair for CB12, had to leave us a little early. But if you don't mind, and forgive me for reading to you, she just sent me a message that I would like to share with you all. Uh, on behalf of CB12, thanks for the warm welcome. We had a new, ele a new elected body that is motivated and excited to continue to work with the, the board the, to scale the work of the board. Uh, this month, they celebrated the redesign of a local basketball court, which was a true community partnership with the New York City Parks Department that involved included live board meetings from a local barber shop in partnership with Councilmember De La Rosa. We hope to replicate the model with other agency projects this year. OTI will be presenting next month and in her transition to chairmanship. Uh, she aims to connect with everybody uh, at Borough Board and to also share the scope and outcome of the 5G Towers issue. Um, so that is from Kathy. I think I will also in the chat right now share her email address. And I know, Tammy, you had asked me for an updated list of all board members. We were just waiting for the final elections to go through uh, for all the board members. So I will share also a, full, a new contact list for everybody so that you all can connect with each other. Um, just... Hi. Marcia, thank you. My point was actually to do what one of our other chairs so graciously said, find a location that has indoor or outdoor so we can all get together quarterly. Perfect. Um, perfect. While I respect your, your decision to do that together, I would also love to be invited to that if you would, would so allow me to be a part of it as well. Um, just two more, again, I um, just wanted to, in the last few minutes here, um, wanted to remind everybody that uh, next month, again, is gonna be one of those meetings where I think we try to pass a couple of resolutions, one on million trees, because we, I think at this point, we've seen the majority of boards will have uh, considered uh, a resolution on this topic. So just just reminding you that next month, we'll, set, we'll share a resolution draft with you beforehand. Um, but since most of our boards have done that, we will be looking for borough board. Um, also looking at the budget, um, there may be a couple other items coming up, um, but just to warn you that that next meeting, um, you know, that's, that's what we'll, we'll do there. Um, and then I, forgive me, Tammy, I, I completely wanted to say this earlier and I didn't, but I know that we lost a board member, um, on CB1, uh, in this last month, uh, Ms. Gupta and I, I just wanted to say, um, it's a terrible way to end a meeting, but I, but, you know, we're, we're, We've been thinking about CB1. Um, we're so sorry. I know that it was in some ways not unexpected. We've been I've been getting updates from uh, Lucian on her um, for the last few months. But if you wanted to say anything about her, I thought that um, it might be nice for anybody who knows uh, Miss Gupta or knew Miss Gupta or knew at least uh, the role that she played in the in the community it was a longstanding impact that she had on many various projects uh, down in Gateway. I think, um, and I just uh, wanted to give you an opportunity to do so. Thanks, sir. I really appreciate it. Um, it's a real personal loss for me and for the community. I mean, Kathy was one of the founders of Manhattan Youth, which serves thousands and thousands of kids in CB1, 2, 3, and actually so many places. Manhattan Youth wouldn't be here without Kathy. Um, she was one of, she's lived in lower Manhattan over you know, three decades and really was a principal in helping form and shape CB1 in so many ways, and yet not a name that you would know because she lived a life through public service. She was director of development at the Henry Street Settlement, and yet that's where she retired from, retired, um, because you couldn't ever say that Kathy retired. She became a consultant 
and did so many amazing things working with communities throughout the city. I will drop into the chat the broadsheet article that was sent around about her, um, which I think really spoke well to who she was. And yet, the most important thing I think is even in her free time, she chose to serve on a community board and she chose to improve the little area that she lived in from everything from senior services to fighting for libraries to I mean the things that we all know and love in community board one she was a very quiet beautiful presence you didn't know her name but I guarantee her fingerprint was was somewhere around and that I think is sorely needed these days in public service are people who are willing to put the work in without the accolades. So a lot of what we do, I'd say that's all of us here, all of the chairs, we're all here, we're all trying to make our communities better. She would have never been a chair, absolutely never. She just preferred working and she will be long remembered. The belongings from her apartment are in the 9-11 Museum. She has passed from 9-11 related cancer and I'm sorry to say that she's not our only member of our community, nor will she be the last in this year. So I appreciate all the support. Thank you for sharing the link, Tricia. Please read it. And if anything says anything, let's continue the great work we do because it matters. So thank you. Absolutely. And um, again, just please pass along our condolences and uh, thoughts to everybody on, C on CB1. Um, with that, uh, I know it's a harsh transition, but um, I think that that concludes our agenda. Do we have a, a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Thank you. Sir. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Without any, any opposition or abstentions, then the motion carries. Uh, please take care, take care of yourselves, stay safe and healthy, and we'll look forward to seeing you all, hopefully at the State of the Borough on the 31st, but if not, then on in February. Bye, everybody.